Uh, so we'll, we'll make a start and uh, first of all, hello and welcome and greetings to all distinguished participants joining us today. My name is Peter Taylor. I'm Director of Research at the Institute of Development Studies here in the UK. And I'm really delighted to welcome you all to the launch of the COVID-19 Learning Evidence and Research Programme, CLEAR, which is a two and a half year programme supported by the UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, which aims to support an evidence-informed COVID-19 response and recovery in Bangladesh. And today is really exciting um, because we're going to have the opportunity to hear from guests who will enable us to understand more about CLEAR. And suffice to say that CLEAR's importance lies in its goal of supporting research within the Bangladesh context, given the need for evidence on a number of priority areas to analyze the social and political disruptions and impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. And also very importantly, to create a coalition of actors who will champion use of this evidence to develop effective policy and programmatic responses. So it's really great to have this opportunity to engage with you all today. I think it's going to be a very informative session and there'll also be an opportunity for participants to put questions uh, later on in the session. So just a few uh, technical notes, first of all, which I'm sure everybody now will be very familiar with. Uh, first of all, um, just to say that uh, we are recording the event. We'll be taking questions at the end, uh, but we'll invite you please to add the questions to the chat function at the bottom throughout the group. And if you'd also like to say, uh, you know, to introduce yourselves and say who you are in the chat, that would be very welcome as well. Um, and then just to say that the Zoom event will be closed at the end of the event uh, it'll probably come to an end rather suddenly. So we, we'll just apologize right at the, the beginning of the session for that. If by the time we get to the end, things uh, shut quite quite briefly. Uh, but at the same time, I believe in this hour and a half, we're going to have a lot of opportunity to be able to exchange and to discuss this new program. Um, so before I uh, just introduce our, our speakers, I would also just like to say, uh, what the purpose of this session is today. First of all, to enable us to hear from the Foreign and Commonwealth Development Office representative in uh, Bangladesh, because as the funder of the program, just to say a little bit about the opportunity that's presents for strengthening the knowledge partnership between the UK and Bangladesh. We're going to hear an overview of the objectives, clear, and also about some of the emerging research themes. And also, I think very importantly, an outline of the process relating to a call for proposals. And then we're also going to hear um, the role uh, of um, the uh, BIGD, Bangladesh Institute of Governance and Development, to talk about um, their role and also to reflect on some of those research priorities emerging from some scoping papers which have often been prepared. So a quick word then on our uh, guests today, who we're going to hear from shortly. And I'd like to uh, also say, first of all, um, that unfortunately, uh, the Honourable Minister of State, Ministry of Planning, uh, Dr. Shamsul Alam, sent his apologies. He was unable to attend, but he does wish the best for this endeavour, <clears throat> and he certainly hopes to be engaged further on in the programme. So we appreciate him sending his message as well. Um, for our speakers here today, our, our first speaker shortly will be Judith Herbertson, who is Development Director, uh, Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office in Bangladesh. Uh, she took charge as the Development Director at the FCDO in Bangladesh during early 2019, having joined DFID, as was, in 2003, and has since held posts overseas in Ethiopia, Afghanistan, Sudan, and Pakistan. He's also worked in policy and corporate roles in the UK, including on DFID's resource allocation model, DFID's work with and through multilateral organizations, and also UK support to Somalia. Her recent past position in DFID Pakistan was leading the department responsible for developing policy and programming with partners to increase the focus on open societies, transparency and accountability, to build stronger systems and institutions of governance, and to combat corruption in all its forms. And she has a BA in modern languages and literature there from the UK. And uh, Judith, I think with that expertise and background, it's going to make an enormous contribution to uh, the session today. Um, following then, we, we're also going to hear today from uh, from Dr. Imran Nakhtim, and he is Executive Director of the BRAC Institute of Governance and Development, BIGD. Uh, he provides strategic direction and oversees strategy implementation for advancing BIGD's mission, expands and nurtures stakeholder relationships, and is responsible 
for the overall management of human financial and physical resources. And he's been involved, he's very familiar uh, to us as a collaborator and partner at IDS as well. He's been involved in major research studies on microfinance, extreme poverty and social protection, and he's held diverse national and international positions in global research and development organizations, including Innovations for Poverty Action, Save the Children International, the International Growth Center, and BRAC International and Springfield Center for Business and Development in Durham in the UK. Uh, and he has a PhD in economics from the University of Sussex in the UK. And then Sohela Nazneen, my colleague from IDS, is, a clear, is, the, is the clear program lead and also an IDS research fellow. Um, she's based in our governance cluster, and leads IDS's research on gender and politics. And her work focuses on women's empowerment, feminist movements, and state responsiveness to gender equality policies in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. She's published widely on these issues, including World Development, Contemporary South Asia, Gender and Development, and other journals. Before joining IDS, Sahela was a professor at the Department of International Relations at the University of Dhaka and a fellow at BIGD, Brack University. And she's worked as a consultant for SDC, UN Women, Irish Aid, the Carter Foundation, and other agencies. And she convenes our IDS flagship master's program in gender and development. So welcome to all of our speakers today. And I'm going to begin by first inviting Judith Herbertson, if I may, to share some words with us. Thank you, Judith. Thank you very much indeed for that introduction. I think you probably know more about me than I know about myself. Um, I'd also like to welcome you to this event on behalf of the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. As Peter said, we're funding this project and we're very grateful to everybody, particularly to IDS for their leadership in helping us to deliver it. I scarcely need to explain why we need this work. Uh, we've all been living through the pandemic, trying to learn as we go along, both personally and professionally, how and why do people get infected? What's the impact on society behind the health impact? How has the economy responded both locally and globally? And what's happening as always to the already poor, vulnerable or excluded? And looking forward, what's going to be the medium to long-term impact on politics and possibly conflict? There is no one size fits all answer to this. And now we're two years into the pandemic we need to address some of the questions. We've looked globally, we've probably looked in our own you know, corners of the world, and we're all coming together now to look at what we can do tailored to the context here in Bangladesh. Why have so many people had asymptomatic COVID in Bangladesh? Completely different from what happened in the UK. I would love to know the answer. But we all still know that we're dealing with more questions than answers. So as Peter said, CLEAR is a research program specifically aimed at supporting Bangladesh's response to the pandemic. It's not just to look back and say, good job done, more research papers on the shelf. And it's not about filling gaps in the literature, although that may be a bonus. It's essential that the data and research coming out of the program is both useful and actionable, primarily for government, but also for NGOs and other development partners. And the pandemic has really demonstrated yet again the essential nature of having timely and reliable data and evidence. Having good systems in place for gathering the data is essential, whether it's disease surveillance sites, longitudinal studies, or access to administrative data. And obviously we should be trying to build the capacity of government both to gather and use and be informed by the data. And BIGD's livelihood surveys are an excellent example of this type of rapid data and analysis, invaluable in a crisis. I think it's fair to say the culture of using data and evidence in Bangladesh for deci decision making is not very well established yet, and it will take time and effort for this culture to change. But this is the right time, there are silver linings to this pandemic, to collectively invest in trying to make that change. The political will is there, we're all worried enough, and we know that we need to learn some very big lessons from the pandemic, be it to fight the next pandemic or to handle antimicrobial resistance, which is actually much more likely than another pandemic, or to face up to the enormous challenges as we try to tackle climate change, which we know is already the lived experience of so many here. 
So with CLEAR, the UK is acting as a knowledge partner for Bangladesh by funding research. And we will then be trying to use, I hope, all our collective energy and influence to bring this to the government to inform their policy making. We've started eight, uh, sorry, work on eight scoping papers due to be completed in March. And there's also, as you know, a series of consultations, this being one of them, ongoing with government NGOs and academics. And if I can just give you five quick headlines to whet your appetite. This one won't surprise you. Overall, data availability is a big problem and officials need actionable and feasible ideas that they can advocate for and implement, not ideal scenarios that nobody is going to give them the space and the time to work towards. On education, we know that the impact on learning is huge, but the scale is unknown and the detail is unknown and what we do about it. But the government is very much looking for, for help on that. On social protection, we know we need to expand the scale and scope in emergencies like this or other humanitarian disasters, especially in the urban areas. But in urban areas, it's really difficult because lots of people don't have fixed addresses or documentation. So as usual, the first big hurdle is targeting. And then what next? Labour rights, similarly, very difficult, especially for informal workers. And we're delighted that Dhaka North City Corporation is about to start a pilot to look at, for example, dedicated spaces for street vendors. And then finally, and then I'll stop, we have all seen the awful instances of violence against women and girls, and I'm sure against boys and men, but probably in lower numbers. And I'm sure we're all sickened, not wishing to speak for anybody, by the daily diet in the media that we see. And this is another area that we're going to be able to tackle. Why is it that there is so much more gender-based violence in the context of the pandemic? We can all guess, but we need the data, we need the evidence so that we can act on it and act, it quick, act quickly. So thank you very much for joining. Really looking forward to the discussions and thank you, thank you for letting me frame the discussion from the outset. Back to you. Thank you so much, Judith. And again, you know, the support uh, of FCBO is really appreciated. And I must say that the whole engagement around this with colleagues in Dhaka has been extremely collegial and uh, collaborative, and I'm sure that that's going to continue. So thank you so much for, for that. Um, I would also just like to say before I hand over to Sahila, uh, just to remind everyone that you can post any questions you have in the chat um, after Sohela's um, presentation. There will be an opportunity uh, later on in the session to be able to respond to questions you may have. But I would just like to say thank you to all those who are introducing yourselves in the chat, because that's great. Uh, it's really interesting to see such a, a diverse uh, and obviously committed group who are participating in this today. So that's great. And uh, we you know, encourage you to continue to um, to keep posting uh, your, your short introductions in the chat. Just to say too that um, we, there's an email address as well. And if you have queries you'd like to follow up after the meeting, we'll be sharing that during the session. Um, and, and the session will be recorded and shared online afterwards as well. So lots of opportunities to, uh, to, to get a second chance to hear that. So Judith has given us a really good um, sort of early insights into some of the things which maybe at the heart of CLEAR. And now I'm going to turn to Sahila Nazneen. And as the lead on CLEAR, uh, Sahila is going to give us an overview uh, for about 20 minutes. And uh, I think by then we'll have a, a really good understanding of what CLEAR is about and how it's going to work. So Sahila, over to you. Um, thank you, Peter, um, for giving me the floor. Just uh, if I'm trying to get the screen up to share the details of the program with you, um, but um, basically it's great to see um, sort of the program coming to a launch because we are we have been working on this for about six months. Um, so it's an exciting day for us, IDS, BIGD, and also um, FCDO. Um, so let's see um, if I can get this to um, display. I hope you all can see the screen. So um, good afternoon to everyone who's joining us from Taka. It's really good to have you here. 
Um, and uh, thank you to Judith for framing the discussion in terms of what is this program about and how, um, uh, why we are uh, focusing on this. Um, as Judith has mentioned, um, basically um, there is a need for good rigorous data. And we all know that there are gaps in what we have as evidence. And when you're facing a crisis, not just a health crisis, a pandemic that sort of has economic, social, political impact, you need rapid data, but you also need to be able to use that evidence. So that means you, there is a need for engagement at different levels, not just with the government, but also in the way we engage with what is there and what works and what needs to be done. And there are so many things that, that require doing in this situation. And it is vital for Bangladesh, partly because of the progress we have made uh, in terms of social and economic development. We are at a critical point and how we respond to the crisis we are facing now will sort of shape where we are. In, in the next decade and the decades following because the pandemic has an intergenerational impact as we know. And also we are connected globally to other parts of the world. So it's not just internally looking at what's happening in, in Bangladesh, but also understanding how does that affect our uh, global standing and our relationships. So having said that, um, let's, let me give you a bit of detail about what CLEAR is about. So CLEAR, is a 2.5 year long program. And the focus is on generating uh, relevant evidence that would help us shape effective policies and programmatic responses, uh, but also generate debate on what we know about what works and how can we engage with that? How can we use that knowledge? So in a way, our aim is to build and increase uh, resilience to future shocks that will come because we know other kinds of shocks will be coming, including other forms of pandemic that will have that impact, the impact that we are seeing now. So we need to be better prepared. Um, in terms of 2.5 year long, as we are saying, so we are just ending the inception phase. Um, so, um, and then a new year will start from April. Um, we will go into the details of timeline a bit more, but in terms of objective, as as you have heard from Judith's framing, it is about delivering policy relevant research and evidence that's tailored to Bangladesh's needs. But there's here's the caveat that's linked to it. It's not just research for research sake, it's about promoting evidence uptake. So that means that engagement is a big part of the program. And of course, uh, another objective is to foster that kind of learning environment, learning environment both for program participants, but also for the wider um, communities that use and engage research and different stakeholders. Um, you already know that this is funded by the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, and IDS is coordinating the research. We work closely with BIGD uh, in terms of shaping the research and policy engagement activities in Bangladesh, um, and it's been a pleasure to have them on board. Um, so let me move on to the other details and, and components um, of the program. So CLEAR has um, three components and they're interconnected. So producing research and evidence is a big part that is done through um, grant making, uh, that ideas leads, but there is a process in terms of how these grants are made, and I will talk about it um, in, in, in detail. Um, this inception event is also to introduce our call for proposal. Um, the second uh, component linked to research and evidence is how does policy engagement happen? And a big part and role that IDS and BIGD will play is in supporting the stakeholders to engage in policy, producing policy relevant outputs, but also designing policy relevant events, and then sort of helping to create that kind of network so that uptake can happen. And the last component that's connected to policy engagement is learning, which is basically creating thematic groups within CLEAR grant holders and people who are working on CLEAR, so both IDS researchers and also BIGD researchers, so that there can be greater synthesis of what 
we are seeing from different areas that we will be working on and the lessons for different stakeholders to uh, pick up. So given the three different components, I'll talk about component one, which is basically a big chunk area for, for CLEAR, which focuses on a multidisciplinary research and evidence. How, how do we produce rigorous evidence that is useful and how do we forward the knowledge and research agenda on understanding impacts of um, imp that COVID-19 has had, particularly social and political impact. So in the inception year, um, what we did was try to think through and develop a research agenda or co-develop it, which is through the scoping papers that were produced. And Judith mentioned some of them. So the scoping papers are looking at education uh, and impact of COVID on learning, but also looking through uh, what kind of measures have been taken, what may work, who's working in this area, et cetera. Social protection has been a big um, tool for and mechanism for response for the government, but we all know there are cracks in terms of there are certain uh, categories of people are excluded, there are ways of thinking through what may be innovative mechanisms for addressing particular issues. Um, so it's, it's a big area in terms of not just expanding um, the protection coverage, but also thinking through what kind of innovations may take place. Labor rights, as we already heard, there are specific categories of workers affected in different ways. So you have informal sector workers being affected in different ways, but you also have formal sector workers being affected. Uh, so how are their rights um, protected? What are the issues that are coming up? How has COVID-19 affected the rights of people? Violence against women, we know that it is the silent pandemic as we call it, but there is a need for rigorous data on this to, and to understand the mechanisms that are there to address these issues when COVID-19 doesn't allow the usual mechanisms that we use to work because you need to ensure that you're following uh, health and safety um, guidelines. Um, there are also other papers looking at uh, sort of impact on migration, nutrition and secondary impact on health, both sexual and reproductive health and um, maternal um, and children's health. Um, so that's part of this. The reason why we are doing or we commissioned these scoping papers is to think through uh, what and to shape our competitive call for proposals, which I will talk about a bit more in terms of the competitive grants. So in terms of the scoping papers are allowing us to think through where, are, where is the need for evidence and then what can be done and who may be possibly interested inside um, the government to engage uh, with what is being produced. So um, we, we will be shaping these calls, but we are also developing a process for grant management, which I will talk about a bit more. Um, the other thing that we needed to do in terms of producing evidence is to think through what will ensure um, quality assurance in terms of the research process and how can we support uh, our grantees in terms of production of outputs, but also engagement. We obviously had to think about what would be our uh, governance structure um, in terms of how we um, manage the grants, how we take decisions about them, but how we also operate in terms of creating an open space where agenda can be co-created and uh, discussions facilitated and also ownership of the partners. So let me tell you a bit about the types of grants under this program. Um, so one, one type are agile grants. These these grants are for supplementing ongoing projects. So partners who already have projects ongoing already have data sets that match our research priority themes. We, I will talk about these themes in a bit. The maximum grant size is up to 50,000. Um, and basically this is by um, recommendation or invitation uh, where we know about that there are particular um, particular gaps. So feel free to approach us about this in terms of if there are um, th there are certain issues that you are already working on and you want supplementary funds um, and um, want more information about the process. Um, the other two categories, which is what we will be uh, focusing on from April 
2022 are the large grants. These are competitive open calls. Um, so there is a particular process and you come through or you're selected through competition. We have about eight large grants, each of the size of 100,000 pounds. I will talk about the priority themes and the process in a bit. And then there are small grants for focused on niche work on themes that are emerging from the scoping papers and the research, or you may have a particular piece of research that you may want to complete. So it's not, it, this is different from agile grants that you're not supplementing an ongoing um, project, but it may be exploratory areas that you think are relevant, or you may want to finish a particular piece of work um, sort of in terms of the next step. Um, and these are smaller grants and the size is basically around uh, 20 to 25,000. So let's talk about the priority theme a bit. So as you heard from Judith um, and also from, from our write-ups and uh, sort of communications about the project that this program focuses on the social and political impact of COVID. So a lot of research focuses on the economic impact. So in terms of what's happening to the livelihoods, what's happening to people's income, which is important for us, but we also would like to look at what, what it has been the political impact. So for example, thinking through what happens, what has happened through um, on what's the impact on, for example, looking at labor rights issues, that's, that's a political issue in terms of how we think about people's rights. Or it is about, for example, looking at service delivery mechanisms. So how do you deliver social protection? And what are the governance issues and challenges there? Uh, we also would like to look at social impact, which is why we are looking at issues around, um, for example, let's say gender equality and impact on violence against uh, women. Uh, so, uh, if you think in terms of that, we are trying to produce evidence that goes beyond just economic impact or just looking at health impact. So in terms of connecting the thema broader thematic areas, the first area is, of course, poverty and vulnerability. So think through which social groups are more vulnerable. If you want to look at sectors like, for example, in education, who is excluded, think think through in terms of nutrition, what might be the social impacts or intergenerational impacts. Um, so there are ways of framing this issue. Um, the other thematic area that we are looking at is, is basically around governance. So looking at service delivery mechanisms, accountability, the service delivery could be in many different sectors. It could be in education, it could be in health, it could be in nutrition programs, it could be around justice sector. Um, so. It could, it could vary, but the focus is on through the accountability lens or service delivery lens, uh, looking through how bureaucracies function or how citizens interact with the state. Uh, the third area is looking at rights. So taking the rights lens to look at how marginalized and disadvantaged groups are affected, whether you want to look at disability or whether you want to look at specifically hard to reach population in a hard to reach area or, or whether you want to explore adolescent girls. Um, so vulnerable groups of population, but it's about their rights and impact on, on sort of how do we protect their rights and what are the ways and mechanisms to do that better in terms of producing evidence on that. And the last area, which is connected, but the focus is different, is on innovations. So this could be technology. So a lot of the time our focus is on, let's say, digital innovation. So if you want to think about how um, education is delivered through digital technology or social protection, um, uh, coverage is increased, or you provide health information and tracking that. But it is also about policy and programmatic responses. So government has taken certain innovative steps, uh, looking through what is there, or NGOs and other civil society organizations may have taken innovative measures. So what is, um, what is there? In terms of the timeline for and call for proposals, uh, the call for proposals will come out in April 2022. Um, the closing date for competitive grants, and it does seem a bit short uh, in terms of you have uh, two months is um, May 2022. Um, we will select and award the large grants by July 2022. Um, 
and the small grants are reviewed on a rolling basis. So it depends on when your application comes in and then uh, what we look for. Um, we will provide the grantees guidance on reporting formats, ethical review process, safeguarding. If there's dispute between IDS and the grantees, how do we resolve that? So those are all being developed. Um, this is where uh, the important information is in terms of criteria for what we are looking for. We are looking for a track record that you have in the area that you propose to research. Uh, we are looking at sort of how do you connect it back to the priority themes, how you, how you frame your case for support in terms of where's the evidence gap and what needs to be filled in um, and why is it important. Uh, we are also uh, looking for whether you have the relevant networks or partners to make sure that the evidence is uh, taken up. Um, by whether that's specific government policy uh, departments or programmatic um, departments, or if you're thinking through in terms of that you will target civil society more, uh, we would like to see that you are uh, able and credible to manage substantial funds. And of course, our values are very important to us. So this, uh, this uh, program operates on uh, values of collegiality, transparency, accountability, um, our values around uh, shared collaboration. So those are all very important and that, that, is, that comes through in terms of what you're proposing um, to do. Um, so because the research is connected to policy engagement and learning, so I'm just giving you a little bit on what we have there. Uh, we do have uh, the IDS team and the BIGD team who is there to help you um, sort of tailor your program to think through stakeholder engagement and also the final production of policy relevant outputs that you may propose. Um, we will establish thematic working groups. So once we have the grantees selected in terms of facilitating cross learning through regular interactions and also bringing in experts in your area and sort of discussions around methods. And the last bit, of course, in, in the last year of, of the program, we will be synthesizing lessons. So there is going to be space for you to provide input um, into that. Um, so I know that's quite a bit of information to take in. Um, feel free to ask um, questions and or put questions in the chat box about priority themes or if you have on like what are the grant making process or the nitty gritties of that. Um, this is basically the contact detail. Uh, we will share this on the web and also in the chat box and in, through, uh, through email lists. So please do sign up so you get regular information on when is the call coming out. Also information about the scoping papers and, and the two pages that we have on that because that will give you a hint of what have we been working on and some of our interests that we have identified under the priority. Uh, themes. So I will stop sharing my screen here. And uh, that sort of brings me to the end of what we wanted to tell you about, um, about the program itself. Uh, we are very excited to have you here and, um, and hope for um, to have greater engagement with you. So uh, please do not hold back on, on asking questions. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Sahila. And there are some questions and thoughts already appearing in the chat, which is great. Um, but before we get to those, I'm, we're just going to have one more uh, presentation just to sort of round out where we are at the moment. So I'll just invite Dr. Imran Martin, who is Executive Director of Brack Institute of Governance Development. So tell us a little bit about, uh, to share some reflections on how the research agenda has been informed by the, the scoping paper process and partnership to date. So Imran, may I invite you to Take the floor. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can am I audible? Yes, you are. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Great. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, so what I'll try and summarize is a bit uh, on uh, our scoping paperwork that we have been doing, um, uh, and we have had a consultation workshop of three of the five scoping paper and well I'll try and uh, provide a bit of a su summary on on what we are getting from the different uh, stakeholder workshops as well okay so so I think this has already been said uh, 
but I just want to highlight that this research program uh, is, is, is really, I think somebody was mentioning in the chat box as well. Uh, I think this is, uh, it's often said building back better, but I think it's really building forward better because uh, what, we, what we really have is an opportunity in many ways um, to, uh, uh, to be actually be able to uh, uh, build forward better because I think some of the gaps and cracks in the system uh, are, are, are just be, been so glaringly obvious. Uh, and I think a, you know, a crisis basically you know, allows you to do that audit test, if you like, that rapid audit test. And, and I think a system, if it cannot withstand uh, this type of crisis is, is shaky in terms of its resilience. So I think uh, it creates an opportunity and it creates also a political momentum and it's something we need to really build on and identify smartly, not in a naive way, not in a first best principle way, but in an intelligent, smart way, what are the smart entry points, smart political entry points to really get you know, building forward better. And I think that really is a very important theme that should drive uh, our priority. Uh, so there are five, um, uh, five areas or five, you know, yeah, five topics on which uh, uh, at BIGD we did, uh, we did a scoping uh, paper, we developed a scoping paper, reviewing existing evidence, looking at what the gaps are, and then, and then also, you know, engaging with, uh, with, with, uh, with, with stakeholders. So uh, international labor migration, clearly a critical area, has been very badly affected, but again, there are puzzles and I think there are opportunities. Learning loss and decay, this is a huge, one of the biggest emergency that we currently have. And I think one that is going to be the most devastating and damaging for the country. Uh, labor rights, uh, again, you know, in a, in a situation of uh, economic downturn, recovery, yes, but there's still economic fragility, uh, rights go off the window. And I think that's exactly where it's really important uh, to really focus on labor right issue and how to re-architecture relationship between state, capital, and labor. Um, and then social protection, clearly, absolutely critical. And we have seen the gaps in the social protection system that really, you know, kind of, I think, is an urgent call for fixing. Uh, you know, uh, uh, and then violence against women, we sort of talked about that. Uh, there's a draft scoping uh, uh, is now being reviewed by experts and we have had consultation with stakeholders and based on that, we'll finalize this. And then final scoping papers then will feed into the RFPs for competitive grant. Uh, that's the basic process. Now, we, you know, I've got a lot of things here I'm not going to go through. Uh, so let me just start with just a few points. Uh, international migration. So clearly remittance is a lifeblood for the Bangladesh economy in terms of foreign exchange. RMG and remittance, the two R's are sort of critical, right? And then we have agriculture sector, there's a third one. So I think this is really, really critical, the, uh, the, the international migration. And we have a puzzle here. You know, what we see is, if you see the graph, it's a small one there. The red line is basically uh, 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 the number of uh, international migrants, which took a dip uh, during COVID. It's just beginning to pick up. But look at the green line, that's a remittance figure. That is actually, you know, sort of growing and sort of sort of you know keeping up so i think this puzzle what does this really mean uh you know there are many hypotheses but i think this is this is a very central puzzle but what is really happening in a human from a human point of view not from a money point of view is sort of few things so one is you basically have uh, a lot of people who have, who have returned and not being able to kind of go back because of economic downturn globally uh uh Primarily, so there is a there is a there is a a, a, a whole a huge issue of reintegration that has suddenly come to the fore. Uh, uh, you know, BMET collects quite a bit of data on you know they, there's information about people going out, but there is not much information about people coming back because that was not seen as a big issue. Now it has emerged as a big issue. It's being taken seriously, and I think this is an opportunity. Uh, in many ways, not only for those who are now we have to deal with, who are being who are not being able to go back and ensure they're reintegrated, you know, properly. And there are different heterogeneity among these groups. I mean, you have got very vulnerable women and you know, pretty, you know, kind of entrepreneurial groups as well. So the, the responses of reintegration have to be very, very different because the experiences have been very, very different of the shock. 
But I think it also creates an opportunity to really plan reintegration, to bring reintegration into the policy discourse, because that has never been part of the of the policy discourse. So I think it's a huge opportunity in 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 many ways, right? So so I think that's the kind of big opportunity here. Now, learning emergency. Now you know it's it's clear we have had a learning crisis for many years. Uh, you know I think uh, uh, I think that that was there, but now we have an emergency situation. So we have. Uh, uh, not only a risk of learning loss and actual learning loss, but actually we may have learning decay, right? Uh, with such prolonged closure, you have learning decay. So, and in that type of a situation, you basically, you can imagine the kind of uh, risk it would create, not only in terms of dropout, but also in terms of human capital formation in sort of generally. So I think, I think this is really the sort of the, the, the huge, hugely, uh, uh, you know, critical emergency that we need to really uh, work on and we need to focus on. There are direct effects that is due to the school closure, but I think much more important are the indirect mechanisms through which, you know, uh, we're going to have a lot of feedback effect, which is much larger. And this is primarily coming through the economic downturn, the economic downturn, and through that, the malnutrition, the child marriage, uh, uh, risk, the early entry to labor force, all of these are coming from the indirect effect, not necessarily from the school closure itself, but from the larger economic context within, within the school closure is happening. So I think the feedback effect of this direct and indirect is really important uh, to sort of understand. And then of course, there are certain groups that are way more vulnerable. I mean, the work that we have done and it's a very rapid research that, that we did with PPRC, we found that the secondary school boys are, are, are the, a very high risk in terms of learning loss. Now this emerged much more, you know, I think during the COVID period, I think this is a new kind of vulnerable group. I mean, we usually had other groups, extreme poor household, remote areas, you know, girls of a particular age group. On top of that, we have a new group, which is the secondary school boys, which has really emerged and, you know, uh, from, from the research, right? Uh, and, and, and I think, uh, you know, I mean, I think, I think, you know, the kind of the big, We've had consultation. I think the big, uh, you know, kind of focus in the consultation that emerged, I think, is is the real importance of acknowledgement of the learning crisis that it is an emergency, and I think there isn't that kind of a wake up call as yet. And I think we really need to, you know, coalesce around this agenda and then you know turn this into you know a, a, a shared sense of feeling of 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 an emergency that we are. We are, we are in and this is ticking away. And we really need to kind of really mobilize ourselves uh, to sort of uh, handle this. So this is really critical, but fortunately, I think we know, you know I, think, I think in Bangladesh and globally, there are, uh, there, there are proven interventions that we know and we just need to adapt it in our context. So we know that, uh, you know, the, for many years, the supplementary community-based education uh, models, the non-formal uh, models uh, have been very effective. Right. Uh, we just need to kind of, you know, kind of adjust that in this in this sort of current context. We know that there are uh, interventions such as teaching at right level. Uh, uh, there's huge amount of rigorous evidence on that. We just need to adapt it in our context. Exactly how do we weave it in, in uh, in terms of our education system? So so you know, it's not so much of new evidence. It's more how do you adapt and weave things in, and create the political momentum for that opening, that is what really is needed. So this is learning emergency. Labor rights, uh, this is another, you know, kind of, as I said, uh, when you have a, a, you know, kind of a fragile uh, economic uh, uh, situation globally and locally, uh, you, you basically have, you know, a situation where labor rights uh, become extremely vulnerable and labor rights have been very vulnerable uh, in, in the Bangladesh context uh, and very marginal progress have been made and that even that have not been very sustainable, even in the RMB sector with, with all the effort in terms of the Accord Alliance and so on and so forth, it hasn't really stuck. So, so that has gone, you know, that has become worse. But again, uh, and, and what we did in the, in, in the scoping paper, we basically took a, a, a Three sectors, four sectors actually. We looked at the RMG, uh, that's really important. We looked at the transport sector, it's been very heavily affected as well. Street vendors as the inf urban informal sector, and we heard from uh, Judith about the DNCC uh, uh, street vendor interest, and you know we are also involved with that from BIGD along with BRAC. 
and then the beauty parlor this is another sector we looked at so i think i think what we basically see again here opportunity right i mean because because right now the whole ldc graduation uh, there is this whole gsp plus facility that bangladesh government is targeting right and this requires due diligence this requires actually is an opportunity here in terms of uh, you know kind of getting uh, uh, some of this labor right issue, uh, 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 safety issues, uh, labor welfare issues into the agenda in a far more concrete and practical way that would work for us and that will actually stick. So I think there's opportunity here. Uh, 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 and, and we need to really find this opening like street vendor, DNCC, uh, you know, opportunity. Now there's opportunity there. We should really kind of see how do we hook into that, right? So. So, so that's uh, that's basically. I just want to also. We did not really look at this sector, but this is this is the emerging sector that has become even that has even grown and has actually been the kind of uh, it has sort of caught you know caught many of the vulnerable non poor. And this is the this is the platform economy workers. And I think this we really need to focus on. We need you to understand what's hap what's going on here, uh, the worker situation there, and the right situation there. And we need to think innovatively about 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 you know, how do we organize this group and provide social protection uh, for the platform economy workers? Because this is a large, large sector right now in Bangladesh, which has grown significantly uh, uh, during, during COVID. And I think this would require special uh, focus. Okay, social protection, uh, I think so much. I mean, this is the area that I think we, we, we know a lot more. I mean, a lot more research has been done. And we know that, you know, the social protection system, I mean, very fundamentally, uh, targeting remains to be a huge issue. And by targeting, it is not only the, it is not only the mechanistic elements of the targeting, but the socio-political uh, uh, realities through which targeting actually gets implemented. So yes, there are issues uh, in terms of, uh, you know, kind of how do you get the targeting methodology right? And, uh, uh, you know, that's really important, but there are implementation issues that are not that that is not only about the efficiency of the targeting indicators but more about the socio-political realities within which power is played out uh, 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 through this through this social protection mechanism so i think it's really important that we take that type of a socio-political angle to the social protection and that could actually contribute a lot because i think there's a lot of work that others are doing in terms of how to use technology uh, you know, mobile data, mobile usage data to do better targeting or at least do screening and all that stuff. I think that if the focus is much more on the socio-political and the power dynamics, uh, you know, and grievance and, and you know, sort of uh, 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 more accountability mechanisms, I think that would be uh, uh, extremely, I think, valuable here. Uh, uh, finally, uh, violence against women. Again, I think this is another, uh, you know, you know, it's reported that this has really gone up, but the mechanisms through which this has happened is important, not only as an academic exercise, but the mechanisms are important to understand because this will help us design interventions, right? Uh, so what are the mechanisms? What is happening within the household? Why aren't, you know, women now that labor market is opening up? We see that, you know, there's, there's, there's a, there's, there seems to be a stickiness in terms of the unemployment situation for, for, for women. What is causing this stickiness, you know, and what is going to unlock it? So it's really, I mean, it's really important because this violence against women has got to do with labor market uh, uh, mobility and labor market opportunities as sort of as well. So I think I think this is really important to understand. Uh, 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 I think there are also, uh, uh, I mean, this has been mentioned. I think there is uh, a lot of need for more consistent data and measurement around uh, around around violence against women, domestic violence, and sort of general violence against women, gender-based violence. I think, I think there's a lot of, a uh, uh, lot of, uh, uh, many people have been working on it, but I think we need a kind of a, some common uh, standards around how we measure things so that we, we have interoperable evidence. You know, one of the big challenges is that evidence, uh, interoperability of evidence is very low. Uh, and I think, uh, I think that's really important because otherwise, how do we build body of knowledge if, if evidence is all fragmented. So we basically need, you know, especially in areas such as these, uh, it's really important that we, we, we basically push for, you know, more, more uh, you know, common 
measurements. I think this is really, really important. Uh, and then there are new emerging areas of vulnerability that, that during this COVID period we are, we, are, we are detecting, but we don't really understand as much. Cyber harassment, clearly, this is, this is big. New dynamics of early marriage is almost an adolescence agency that is being linked up with the whole, uh, uh, the whole uh, you know, online uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, behavior. Uh, uh, so, so you know, early marriage is not only about you know people being pushed, uh, you know, to sort of you know getting married because of dowry and those traditional uh, ways in which we uh, drive us through which we thought early marriage happens. But there's also other forms of agency that is that is also you know kind of emerging. It's problematic in many ways, but we need to understand this to be able to come up with uh, you know uh, interventions, long-term impact of gender-based violence. I mean, clearly, uh, you know uh, uh, that is something that's really important to be able to have conversation with ministers of finance, for instance, to really understand you know what is the what is the real cost of this of this of this gender-based violence, and to do that, long-term impact of GBVs would also be. Is, is, is extremely, extremely important to feed into that type of estimation and calculation. So that's basically it from the different scoping paperwork and consultations we've been doing. We have done three, two more left. I'm quite involved and engaged with these uh, conversations and I'm really enjoying them. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Imran. And uh, I think it's, it raises the excitement actually to get a sense of what, what the content is really and the thinking that's emerged so far around what the issues are, which is which is really exciting. So thank you very much indeed, uh, and thank you to all the, the presenters indeed for uh, actually for for keeping us on, on time as well, which is a, it's a significant achievement. And it's really good to see that there's you know there's been hovering around eighty participants throughout this call, which is I think indicates again the interest. So we have now an opportunity to. Uh, look at some questions and to ask our, our speakers to respond to those. I think we've got different groups of questions. Um, the first one I'm just going to raise in a moment, which kind of is an interesting question because I think it's just about the overall sort of purpose and intent of CLEAR overall, which it would be good just perhaps from any of our speakers to, to get a, a, a little reaction. And then we have a series of quite specific speakers. Some of them are on very uh, specific points on the mechanics and the technical components of how the calls will work. And then there are also some questions which relate to particular issues or areas of interest and whether or not they may be included. And I'll just say too that I'd encourage everybody uh, interested in this to sign up to the CLEAR newsletter because we have, uh, we, that, that's going to be, that, that is now launched. And if I could ask uh, Alan perhaps just to put that, the link into the chat just now. So, because it was, it was there earlier, but there's been quite a lot in the chat, so you'd have to scroll back quite a long way and you'll find that link. If you there, go there, you can register for updates and more news and information. Also, there's a website and the uh, today's the recording of today's session will be available on the website and the slide presentations will also be available on the website. So everything which has been shown or spoken about today, you'll be able to uh, access it there as well. So to the questions, first of all, perhaps I could just invite really uh, all, all three of our speakers today, just a reflection. Um, Habibul Konkor has asked her an interesting, uh, raised an interesting point, which I think uh, Imran, to some extent in your presentation just now, you actually responded to. Um, but Habibul's question is, is whether this approach of CLEAR is really aiming to sort of be a response recovery reconstruction type model rather than not just a sort of one-off snapshot, brief snapshot, which uh, you know only really uh, looks at the moment in time and then is sort of all over. And Habibul then added a few more thoughts in the chat and really relating to the idea of taking the pandemic as a moment of opportunity. So it's a crisis, but it's also an opportunity for uh, you know, for, for reimagining through research ways perhaps of building a robust public health infrastructure, uh, you know, changes, evolution of education, more online mechanisms, short in, uh, improvements in governance, more accountability, responsibility, care, more environmental and gender awareness, more justice overall. And I must say, uh, however, well, these are questions and debates we also have at IDS thinking about the you know, the pandemic is also a really significant challenge and, and having many negative impacts, but also moments of opportunity for 
thinking about a different world. And I think uh, Imran said just a few moments ago, building forward better, building forward differently. So perhaps Judith, I could just ask you for your, your reflections, because I think in a way you also, you pose this a little bit in your opening remarks, but you know, just your thoughts from where you sit would be really helpful. Yes, thank you very much. And Habibullah, thank you so much. I think possibly you've almost answered your own question in terms of what um, Peter's just read out to me. But we can learn particularly from crises when it engenders real urgency, political will, a desire to change the way we've done things in the past. And I look back at Bangladesh over the last 50 years and think about how many people died in the early cyclones. And then you look at cyclone Ampan and look at the numbers that died then. And it is extraordinary what the country has done because it wasn't prepared to endure that kind of suffering and loss. And what I'm hoping therefore this, um, this uh, opportunity will be coming from this program, it's quite small scale, but is a way of demonstrating what success can feel like in terms of responding to specific areas where we know there is a major problem after the pandemic. There may have been a fairly big problem pre-pandemic. Maybe it's an excuse, but we will have the politicians and we will have researchers and academics focused on what can we learn from this moment of urgency, if you like. And if that means that um, bureaucratic systems, political systems, become more data-based, evidence-based, research-based. Um, if we can build systems, if it's not about necessarily just a political direction, I mean, politicians have to give political direction, but if we can feed more sense of data and evidence and transparency and accountability into it, then look at SDG 16 and think about the things we are always struggling to achieve and I think this is a real moment to deliver some change and to help some of the, you know, the civil servants, but also the politicians think this is how we can respond to crises or how we can respond to small problems. And I very much hope that that will then help build greater resilience for the future. This won't be the last one. We know that the next one won't look like this. It will be something else. But Bangladesh has learned a huge amount from cyclones you get them regularly and it needs to learn lessons for how it governs better how it responds to exogenous shocks like this better thank you thanks so much judith that's uh, really good observations i'm sure that's going to inspire further thinking too and all those who are you know thinking about how to engage with clear so helen would you like to just uh, make any quick comments on on that and then imran i'll come to you after just again briefly just because uh, we've got a number of technical questions too but just any thoughts on that sort of overarching vision, I guess, of what CLEAR could contribute to? Um, I, I, I think all, all three of us would have a slightly different take, depending on our positions and where we are uh, coming from, um, basically. But for me, what's exciting is, uh, is to think through in terms of particularly this uh, in terms of clear is that a lot of the research um, and evidence that we produce or what we have gets skewed. Uh, when we think about pandemic impact, we sort of focus a lot on what's the economic impact, what is it on livelihood, but it's connected to many different issues, or our discussion is around health and delivery of health, but then that's also connected to many social issues and how we sort of engage at different levels, not just mechanisms of delivery, but issues around accountability there, trust of citizens in the state, et cetera, that we don't always look at. Um, and for Bangladesh, in terms of if you look at the research kind of terrain, there are specific areas where we produce great evidence and then there are gaps we already know that so one of the ways to address that is to sort of push this thinking around what are the social and political impact and as you saw from the scoping papers um, there are ways to think about it the other great thing in terms of the vision of this which judith was referring to and imran has talked about it is that that sort of engagement with with evidence that is produced and a, evidence with research, because 
while we have um, done things quite well, as Judith mentioned, in terms of learning from Cyclone, or we have learned from other development interventions, so think about the microcredit programs, think about oral saline and other things. So we have great tradition in terms of intervention, but in terms of tracking what has changed and how has it changed, while you need to be nimble in a crisis, you can also learn for the future. And to be able to do that, you need that enabling environment and to understand the policy context. So while we need to call the state into account to show where the gaps are, what is being, who's being excluded, at the same time, you can't do it with just confronting the state all the time. You need critical allies inside the state to engage with your work, which is why we are doing the scoping to think through in terms of who are the stakeholders. We are urging our grantees to think through and uptake is a big part of that. Just as we need to shape the public debate and engagement around also what is being produced. It's not just the state, which is why then the learning component is there in terms of how do we learn better so this can serve as a as a model uh, for other ways of of doing things and and then and, and of course opportunities are different for different sectors some are more amenable sometimes some things are difficult so there's also a way of thinking through where is the opening which some some of it Imran talked about in terms of where's the opening or certain new issues are coming up what we saw with integration of migrant workers that we haven't talked about so taking um opportunity um and then making use of it um uh, we have come a long way as a as a country and uh, we will go further we do, we have always been innovative we need to harness that strength and work together and work with everybody so Hela, um, Imran, can I just turn to you and perhaps just uh, again any brief thoughts? We've got quite a number of uh, quite specific questions too, but I, I think you know given what you yeah, shared no, I with think, us, I think okay. yeah, no, I think I think I think you know, I mean, I I sort of I think agree with what uh, Judith and uh, Sohela said, but just just one uh, you know, my hope is that uh, you know policy engagement often I have seen uh, can be very tick tick boxy. Here, we really, I hope that we will take a bit of risk. Uh, there are, uh, uh, and be thoughtful about, uh, about finding entry points. And if you're really serious about entry point, then entry points, you know, some would, would be risky, some would not work. And, you know, so uh, uh, I just think that, you know, uh, this, this tick boxing approach towards policy engagement uh, doesn't serve knowledge generation well and doesn't serve policy engagement well either. And I think that's something that would be really important. I, I'm, I'm absolutely, we need, we, need, we, need to inf we need to engage with policymakers. And here, you know, it's, it's a much broader policy environment we're talking about, not only, not only you know, kind of the government, but also you know, other, other uh, you know, NGOs, civil society actors, media, and so on and so forth. But, but I think we just need to push ourselves to go beyond just you know the kind of usual things that 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 is usually done, uh, uh, which 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 you know you either you don't have enough time you're giving to the research and evidence building, neither you do the policy engagement work properly, and I think this is something I I hope that we would be uh, thoughtful about, we'd be honest about, and because it's an opportunity, I I I really think there are openings here. And I, but to, to, to sort of to sculpt those openings, to be able to work with those openings, there are, you know, there are certain different ways of approaching these. And I think that's something we need to, we need to also be, uh, you know, um, creative and innovative about. Thank you. Thank you, Imran. Again, really helpful. And I, I think just that conversation has helped also to, I guess, lay out a sort of an understanding of what it is that, um, uh, you know, clear, can, can really seek to try to contribute to. And uh, obviously this is going to be co-created as the, as the work moves forward and you know, um, collaborators and researchers engage in the process. And, and it's going to generate a lot of learning together about where those opportunities are as well. So some of this is going to be somewhat emergent and iterative. Um, I think it's going to be really exciting to see how it evolves in, in real time. 
So thanks for those. Um, now, I think some, we have quite a number of quite specific questions. And so Helen, perhaps I'm going to, I'm going to target you uh, with some of those. I, I'll just say as well, um, some, some of the, the, let me call it the nuts and bolts of calls are, are, are being designed. And so there will be, the calls are going to be made available on the website, I think in April. The scoping papers will be made available before the calls are launched. They're under review at the moment because in fact, there've been some workshops and some engagements around them very recently. So they're being finalized. And when they've been finalized, they'll be loaded up onto the website. And the newsletter is a really great way to keep in touch as well. Also on the website, I was just uh, confirmed with my, my colleagues on the side here, uh, there will be an FAQ of frequently asked questions as well on details of the calls so that as you know, specific questions arise, more information will be available there. Plus there's a, an email contact as well if anyone has specific questions. Uh, but so Helen, if I could turn to you now just with a few of these and you may be able to help us to respond. So uh, in terms of organizations applying, are, they, are, are organizations able to apply for more than one grant type or more than one of the large grants? Yes, they are. Um, whether you get selected then <laughs> depends on the merit of the proposal. And if you are, um, if you are, at, I mean, in, in terms of multiple categories, like we also have to look at who else is applying. So if you're winning one of the large grants and then you win another big one, we, we would have to think through in terms of who else is also compared because there are only eight large grants, right? So we would want to diversify also that, but we don't want to stop people from applying for multiple categories. So if you, if someone from your organization wants to apply for, for a small grant, you want to apply, but you have a team applying for a large grant, that's fine. If you think you want to apply for two or three priority areas, that is fine. Of course, it, it depends on, on sort of the merit and other criteria that we set up for for selection and we will be very clear about that. Great, thank you. Uh, also linked to that, can individual researchers apply for small research grants? Um, so yes, well, what's your thoughts on that? So you would see that there, there is a policy engagement component. It doesn't necessarily always mean that you have to talk to government stakeholders in terms of policy engagement, but you would kind of need to generate debate. So just being an individual person and applying may mean that you might not have that institutional support that you may need. So you want to be based in an institution applying for it. You can certainly be the individual lead and have a very smaller scope in that, but we would encourage that you think about being based in an institution than just being an individual applying for it. Great, thanks. Um, so Hilla, another practical question, can, can you know, groups of researchers putting in a, a bid include researchers from outside Bangladesh? Yes, of course, we would encourage that kind of collaboration, definitely. And also I would point out that for the Agile grants, you can, like it is, it is a particular type of funding where you already have funding for, for the project and you want to supplement your, your fund and you have other funders involved in that. So also do think creatively in terms of, of the categories. Great. And then I think the, the last main sort of technical question, and I'm sure others will arise, is what about timeframes for, for and durations of the grant? So, you know, how long would the projects be expected to be? For example, the large grants, would they be one year or, or you know, what can you give us a sense of what the timeframes are like? Yes, so if we make the final decisions by July 2022, as you know that we are because there um, we operate on values around transparency and accountability and we also have a duty of care to towards our partners and their issues around safeguarding and FCDO requirements so that means the contracting process is a bit long and we would require you to fill in um, due diligence. Um, uh, documents that we have and also go through a particular process that's involved with grant making, we will make those clear. So that means that probably formal contracts would be in place around September of 2022 for the large grant holders. We, we will try to expedite the bureaucratic process as much as possible. Um, so then you have a year to do your research. Uh, again, think through creatively. So if it is September 2023 and our program ends uh, July, um, in January 2020. 
four. So then that kind of means, I hope I'm getting the program here right. That means that we would need a bit of time for synthesis around what is coming out from your research and also to help you um, sort of do the uptake and publicize what is going on. So yes, one year is a good time frame. Right, thanks, thanks, Helen. So I think those are the, the kind of the, the more technical questions in the chat at the moment, others will arise. Uh, and now I'll, I'll move on to some questions about some of the topics and issues and perhaps, so hello, both you and Imran may have some thoughts on these. Uh, I just wanted to say too in the chat, uh, it's quite funny, um, uh, Rabiul had asked, uh, or well, actually commended Imran for his uh, suggestion to move beyond the kickboxing approach in policy engagement. I think it was a typo intended to be tick boxing, but um, it does raise thoughts about energy strategy and tactics in policy engagement. So perhaps kickboxing is uh, is a future element to to build in to clear, but it's something to keep discussing as we as we go forward. Um, so on some of the the topics. Um, so Hilary and Imran, between you, you've given us a good sense of what the scoping papers are, are sort of indicating. I did, one question that came up too, um, perhaps so Hilary, you can just answer this. I think you had mentioned the health, had you mentioned the health scoping paper? I think it didn't come up in Imran's list. So will there be a scoping paper relating to health? Just a quick check-in question. Yes, there is a scoping paper related to health, and there is another scoping paper looking at uh, government redressal mechanisms in specific sectors and how that has been uh, used and engaged with by citizens. So we are doing a scoping on, on that uh, because we are interested in the accountability angle and state citizens engagement. Um, so those are being uh, taken forward by IDS experts and other experts who are working with us. So they will be available. Uh, Imran presented on the scoping papers that were um, sort of taken forward by the BIGD, our BIGD colleagues. And uh, basically we are working with BIGD on those scoping papers in terms of providing comments and, uh, and sort of in terms of shaping the, the protocol that was designed uh, by them. So uh, basically, we have them uh, on, on sort of like the papers are already um, there, the first draft, and Imran was presenting findings for that. But the health paper will be coming in March. Okay, thanks, uh, so because uh, obviously with the, all the different components, a lot of information today, it's good to, to get those clarifications. So just a few uh, questions then on, on some of the topical issues. Uh, perhaps I'll, I'll just... I'll, I'll just run through these and, you know, they may be, you may want to comment or it, it, to some extent it may already have been picked up in, in the presentations. But the, the first one, would the, would, could, could the research projects um, be focused on Cox's Bazaar refugees? That's one. Um, another, would there be any specific research with the export garment workers to deal with the turbulent supply chain? That's the second. Uh, third, in terms of migration, focusing just on international labor migration or also internal migration. So that's uh, a third one. What about hotel and restaurants and tourism sectors? And then the last one that we've seen in the chat is around light, the light engineering sector. So Cox's Bazaar refugees, uh, export garment workers, internal migration, hotel, restaurants and tourism, and light engineering. Um, where might they fit? So here's uh, first, and then we can go to Imran. It depends on which priority thematic area you want to link them up to. So it's not necessarily that, oh, you cannot look at a particular sector. It's sort of, what is it about that sector you're looking at? So are you looking at basically um, in terms of the electric light sector, um, or um, other sectors that you mention, um, are you are you sort of looking at the rights of these workers and what's happening? Because we are, as as you saw from the framing, or uh, it's not necessarily about just economic impact. So how COVID nineteen has affected livelihoods of these workers, which is very important to look at. But the program is about social and political impact. So which angle would you pick up? Is it sort of a particular innovation that has happened, programmatic in terms of reaching them out? Is it about that they're excluded from social protection coverage and they're facing particular problems? You know, so link 
linking it to that and thinking through then how would you then target uh, stuff for uptake? So whether that is engaging with the relevant um, government departments, whether that is about the, at the local level, you want particular type of engagement with the municipality where these uh, factories are, or if it is about basically uh, you want to engage with, with other actors who are working in this sector or could come and work in this sector and they're not looking at thinking through what's the applicability of the knowledge that you would generate. In terms of the RMG and just that being a specific theme, um, as you saw our, what our four priority themes are, which is around poverty and vulnerability, looking at service delivery, governance and accountability. The third one looking at rights, and then the last one is about innovation. So again, if you want to look at RMG and supply chains, we are not just interested in sort of global trade and what's the economic impact. Again, give us the social and political impact of what's happening with RMG uh, workers and what angle would you take? So you, you feel free, you can feel free to sort of think through and focusing on that, but yes. Um, the other bit, um, Peter, that was, so there are quite a few questions so I'm trying to go through the sectors and 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 the issues um so the, there there were like these those hotel restaurants and tourism uh, again what angle are you taking about hotel restaurant and and and, and um so the tourism uh thinking through is it about rights uh, it, of workers in this sector is it about that the workers need particular coverage it is is it is it kind of linking it to the themes that we have so it's not necessarily about sector specific itself it's about what is it that you want to do with that um so thinking through that and and the key thing to remember here is it's about social and political impact not just economic impact uh so you have to go beyond just livelihood and income um so apart from that um the question on cox's bazaar so that is open uh, to question, this is partly because uh, FCDO has work on Cox's Bazaar and there are other um, funders working in that area. So um, that's one of the reasons why we did not focus the scoping work on Cox's Bazaar, um, but we are open to it. Um, Great, Thank, thanks, Helen. And just to say too, there is a, a sort of a sibling platform called the COVID Collective as well, which uh, we engage with, which is also supported by uh, FCDO in, in the UK and uh, uh, Imran and BIGD and other colleagues in Bangladesh are also involved in that. And there's some, some interesting research coming through that too, that I hope we're going to have an opportunity to, you know, to um, share those findings as well through, through CLEAR. Uh, Peter, if I could just quickly make one point. Yeah. So the reason why CLEAR is focused on social and political impact is also because FCDO funds another program that looks at economic impact and has specific areas that, that, that focuses on that. Imran would be able to add more details to it. Um, so that's also another reason why we have uh, sort of made the areas quite distinct and why we are not just looking at economic impact, how economic impact is connected to social and political. Great, right, thanks, Sohela. Uh, Imran, would you like to come in and then, and then after that, we'll have a last, a last few brief further kind of more of the mechanics questions yeah. and then we'll be wrapping up. But Imran, to you. So, so, so there is, uh, you talk about COVID collective, which is this global, you know, kind of uh, uh, research that has been done around you know, COVID economic, social, political, you know, it's a much larger cross-country uh, agenda. Within Bangladesh, there are two kind of sister type of intervention, both you know, FCDO is funding. Judith uh, you know, has been really, um, you know, kind of great about, uh, you know, kind of supporting these. So one is this clear, which is on social political impact, as Zohar uh, said. Uh, it doesn't exclude economic, but it sort of goes beyond economic, and it has a way to think about it, right? And then we have more, which are much more economic in nature. That is a TEPP uh, uh, grant uh, is transforming economic. Uh, I, I forget the acronym, but it's 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 it's, it's another uh, another uh, uh, grant uh, which is uh, being uh, uh, managed uh, by IGC IGC Bangladesh. Uh, so that's 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 another grant, and uh, and I believe uh, there have been uh, webinars on that as well. Uh, yeah, thank you. 
Thank you so much, Imran. Very, very helpful again. Um, okay, we're, we're coming up towards the end, but there's still a couple more questions and, and uh, perhaps, so I'll come back to those uh, for you, but again, of course, um, others are welcome to respond. Are there any specific requirements for methods and research design? And then there's a sort of linked question to that. Is the idea that this should be action research or, you know, is, is the idea that this, we're inviting a kind of plurality of research approaches? We, we are um, heterodox in terms of our, of our method. And uh, we certainly don't uh, necessarily always think that rigor only applies to quantitative methods or that you always have to do randomized controlled trial. Um, I am myself a qualitative researcher and IDS has quite a bit of qualitative researchers. So it depends on, on how you're designing your research and whether that would produce rigorous evidence. Um, so you're welcome to use mixed method approach. You're welcome to use a more quantitative approach. You're welcome to use more of a basket of qual approach, including participatory methods. Or if you want to do action research, that is fine. There are a few things to think about. A, would that uh, lead to production of rigorous evidence? By rigor, again, we are not applying criteria for in terms of just how quantitative research is thought of as rigor, but in terms of whether your data is reliable, is it something that you can apply to the population that you have studied? Not necessarily, you, you don't always need to have a representative sample, but think about the category that you're studying and whether you can say something about that category or draw particular insights onto that. Um, we do also um, sort of uh, encourage you to think that if you have one year's time, what would be feasible in terms of doing, because you need to set it up, collect the data, analyze the data. And it's 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 in a year's time. So obviously analysis would have to be continuous, right? And uh, to help you also think through in terms of the method and to generate a methodological discussion. Uh, that's why we have a process where we will be linking you up with IDS experts, but also the thematic working group. So where you can present the methodological innovations that you have or issues that you're facing for collective uh, solutions. So this is really in the way we are thinking about the program is to generate that diversity, but also a space where people can bring up the debates or the questions that you're, you're kind of raising in the chat box, right? About how do we collaborate uh, with each other and, and learn from each other. Thank you, Sir Helen. So we're, we're really coming up now to towards the end. I think there's one more question, perhaps, I think we should touch a little bit there, but, but can proposals speak to more than one of the other themes? Yes, of course, that's lovely, but obviously also in terms of the, as you saw from the number, um, we would, and then the priority themes, we'd like to have uh, have um, proposals under each theme, right? So it would be useful if you have an emphasis on, on a one particular theme and, and what lens and what theory you would talk to. Yes, we need rapid evidence, but it needs to also talk to the wider literature. So you may have a lens that is more around literature, that's more around poverty and vulnerability, or your lens could be more around accountability. So you need to sort of think through which thematic area you do want to uh, emphasize more, because that would also help you to then design how you want to collect the evidence, what you're collecting, and then how you present your fundings and how you engage with uptake. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Sahela. So I think we'll we'll draw towards a close, and I'm just going to invite each of our uh, speakers just to share any any quick closing reflections that they, they may have. Um, someone has joined. Uh, one, one of our participants has joined, and is just asking about again when will the details about Clear be available in the website? So it's it's being it's being added to all the time uh, as the scoping papers are finalised. They'll be added there. The recording of today's session will be made available. The slides will be made available. There'll be a frequently asked questions section which relates to the calls and the calls will be going live in April. So uh, I, I think it's going to be really good to sign up to the newsletter because that will enable you to sort of keep up with updates in real time. Uh, and again, there is an email in case you have specific questions. Uh, and uh, I see my colleague uh, Orin has put up uh, the link again uh, there where you'll be able to access 
whatever is there already and to watch out for more things being loaded. But let's let's just close now with a few last remarks. Judith, may I invite you? Just uh, you know, any, any key takeaways for you? Today? Thank you so much. It's been fascinating and I'm delighted to see how many people are actually interested in helping us with this. I would just make one final plea. Please be very, very practical. We don't need a whole lot of evidence admiring the problem and looking at it from every different angle and then saying, here, what are you going to do about this? This is supposed to be actionable and it should deliver real information that we can then do something with. So if I were you, I would start from the far end. You know what you're doing better than I do and work out what on earth is the question or the problem we're trying to fix. How are we going to fix it and what do we need to know to do that? So good luck and thank you very much to everybody involved. Thank you, Judith. Um, Imran, may I come to you next? Uh, no, I mean, nothing, I mean, nothing, nothing much. I mean, you know, aside, aside from, you know, I mean, this is really exciting. Um, I think, uh, and again, I mean, again, again, like to, you know, really highlight that there are real uh, opportunities. There are real openings. Um, uh, we just need to be uh, thoughtful, creative, bold, uh, and, and very actionable to be able to uh, have, you know, have, you know, take advantage of those, of those, of those openings and build coalitions as well. So I think, I think this is super exciting. Uh, uh, you know, and it is, it is, it is, it is, it is great. To be Great. Thanks, um, Imran. That, that's, that's great. Uh, and I think excitement is actually the order of the day here. I, I'm fortunate enough to be participating in the executive committee. And I can honestly say that the, you know, the, the level of thinking and uh, engagement and, and preparation for today uh, has really reflected a lot of efforts. And I, I just want to also acknowledge uh, colleagues, both, um, well, colleagues in BIGD working with Imran, also colleagues that we engage with uh, quite extensively in their studio in Dhaka, and also our IDS team, who are also making sure that this webinar itself has worked well today. I just wanted to give my appreciation to to everybody there. So it's uh, it's really is a, a team effort. And just speaking of teams, again, there was a question there. Uh, can you know proposals come from consortia? Well, I think it, as was mentioned earlier, you know, partnerships of groups of researchers within uh, Bangladesh and, and outside Bangladesh are, are welcome. But I think uh, Judith's point about being practical is absolutely right. Uh, you know, will will what you're proposing be able to actually contribute to what it is that you are uh, you know, you're wanting to to be able to to shape, to inform through evidence in terms of different kinds of change uh, in the Bangladesh context. So I think partnerships are welcome, uh, absolutely. But I think again, it's there's a there's a practicality question about you know to what extent will that be able to deliver with the resources available in the time uh, on the question and with the you know perceived goal. So so Helen, a last word from you before we close for today. Um, yes, thank you, Peter, and thank you to everyone uh, for joining us um, in this program, uh, to my IDS colleagues uh, for organizing this and working hard, to my BIGD colleagues for uh, working us from the start, with us from the start uh, for the great scoping papers, but also helping us think through a lot of things, and definitely to FCDO for uh, giving us this opportunity to work in Bangladesh to, uh, to I mean, I'm a Bangladeshi, so of course it's always close to my heart uh, in terms of thinking through not only how do we develop new knowledge and knowledge um, that is relevant, but also how do we make it um, sort of actionable in terms of it's taken forward. So it's not just in academic papers or policy briefs, which is very, very important. So key word for those who are thinking about applying, um, you heard, actionable. If, you if it's innovative, we are very interested. If it's strengthening something that's ongoing, very, very important. But also for us, what is vital is that this program will be what our grantees are. Our grantees make this program. So in terms of the energy, the learning, the skills, everything that you bring in will shape whether we are successful or not. And as an organization, um, ITS, um, 
I, I can promise you that we are lovely people to work with and we are very supportive of the processes, but we also um, are interested in, in engaging and producing an exciting agenda. And uh, we look forward to taking this, this um, into the future and sort of having a stake in how, however small a, a stake in how the knowledge frontier in Bangladesh shapes up. We have been in Bangladesh since its inception, working with Bangladeshi organizations and co colleagues 